patience often had its reward, so he had noted many times before. And so he sat, waiting silently, gazing up as the man slowly ate the evening supper, paying his charge no heed. Gradually, as the dusk deepened into night, the sound of utensils scraping porcelain increased as the meal drew to a close. Till at last the man set down his knife and fork. Wiping his mouth with a napkin, he then rose and crossed, without a glance backwards, towards the dining room door. And as he reached it, he paused at the threshold and motioned with one foot towards the baseboard, where sat a small bowl. A smell, very faint, came from within. As he crept up to espy what lay inside, he beheld the only meal that awaited him that night. Dog food. Like most ghost stories, it begins with the house. In my case, it was this house. It was summer, 1981, Panama City, Florida. We were vacationing in this bit of rental property, and after visiting the beaches and the amusement parks and other bits of tourist bait, the notion was floated to take in a movie. The vote, which seemed to disinclude me, eventually arrived at this choice. A ghost story. I'd seen the TV ads and frankly found even those a little bit creepy. I had been plied with the reassurance, oh, a friend of mine saw it and said it wasn't really that scary. I'm pointing out, decades too late, that this friend was in all likelihood not an 11-year-old kid. So we saw it. Some of it, anyway. I'd seen scary movies before, albeit usually on television when most of the extreme material had been removed. Things like Halloween or the Amityville Horror didn't particularly disturb me. They were kind of fun. Tonally, this was very different. There was an overriding sense that this was far more adult than any film I was used to seeing in the genre. It wasn't good, scary fun. Can this kid the pants off me, Arthur? There was a weight of tension which hung over the proceedings. Us, the Chowder Society. The Chowder Society. Which wasn't dispelled in the least by this scene, which came a mere seven minutes in, completely devoid of any context or forewarning. Though, so as not to spring upon you what was so inconveniently sprung upon me, I'll be providing a helpful countdown to the pertinent bits. What are you? There was more to it, but as far as I was aware, the rest of the scene looked like my lap. But I tried to be a good sport about it, not be some party pooping child ruining everyone else's night. Fine. Nonetheless, there are times when being selfish is not necessarily a really bad idea. A few hours no later, I'd be identifying no all too easily no. with this group of nervous old men who just couldn't seem to sleep peacefully through the night. First comes the fright, then comes the sleep issues. So what was the fright in their case? Like the film's protagonist, fighting out the answer wouldn't be easy, and it wouldn't happen right away. very nearly right away was just how right I'd been to have argued my case. In fact, I should have argued it even more strenuously. Isn't it about time you straightened out? Parents, they never listen. If they did, stuff like this might be avoided. No. No. Out there, my little 11 year old brain went. <laughs> I'd lasted 19 minutes and finally had to insist, in the name of all that is reasonable, that we get the hell out. 
We've got to help the boy. And finally, reason prevailed. Twelve years old. Eleven. And sure, I had classmates that had seen the film to the end and emerged unscathed, but not all of us find the same things terrifying. I'd wager most people out there have a similar film experience lurking somewhere in their past. For my part, I had a long night ahead. It was one of the fantastic perks about being a kid is that the adults got first crack at all the available beds, leaving me to sleep on the floor, where it was completely impossible to keep a watchful eye on the underside of the bed without diverting my attention from the evil dresser. <laughs> but I tried to relax and not think too much about it. Don't think about elephants. What are you thinking about? Elephants. <laughs> then the next morning, the radio acquainted me with this song for the very first time. Yes, life, you are hilarious with your little coincidences. But in some ways, it was a bit embarrassing. Things aren't nearly as scary in the daytime. And I hated not knowing what happened. I mean, mentally, I debated whether or not I should man up about it. He was 12 years old. Fine boy up about it. Wasn't it better just to face the fear than just pretend it hadn't happened? Not now, Ricky. Yes. Now. The opposing impulses were like night and day, literally, as the setting of the sun squashed all semblances of a brave face. You're dissembling. It's beneath you. I'm 12 years old. I mean, 11. Cut me some slack. We've got to do something. And try as I might, I couldn't forget the past and felt myself drawn back. You're going to be seeing some unusual and interesting things before we're through. Of course, there was no internet in those days, so researching ghost story wasn't the comparative cakewalk it'd be today. But I did find one strong lead. The film had been based on a book. And armed with this new resource, I got my mom to read it and tell me what happened. Yeah, what the hell, I was still a coward. And by this time I was 12 years old, but didn't feel any more courageous for it. Still, it seemed like finally knowing what had happened would let me put the whole thing out of my head. The book is the first major success for horror novelist Peter Straub. It told the tale of a group of elderly men haunted by a mysterious presence in an increasingly snowbound New England town of something that stalked and killed livestock without leaving footprints in the snow, of an enigmatic woman who appeared in different times with different names, of a tragic mistake from long ago, of a lineage of deathless, shape-shifting beings from ancient times that walked among humanity. It was, in my mother's estimation, scarier than the film, of which she'd seen relatively little. Well, dodged the bullet there. So finally now, surely, I could just set it aside and move on. And then one day, I was 15 years old, and what's that coming on the television? I think this is a ghost story. Damn it to hell. She had found me. My own TV, in my own room, in my own home. But I was four years older, and surely the network would have cut out those really scary bits. Or perhaps not. But the extra years did help, along with the shift in the film's tone right around this part. For a while, it became almost disarmingly normal as the protagonist related a tale of a perfectly average life that had been invaded by some horrible dread. Yes, I feel you. Please continue. I had landed a year's teaching job at a small liberal arts college just north of Orlando, Florida. Ah, yes, school. That great bastion of commonplace normalcy where we meet all sorts of people who seem so sane at first, who are then only too willing to try to convince us otherwise. It's fair to say I never really believed in ghosts, but weird, troubled people, we've all met those. In high school, I kind of sort of dated a girl who had gone out of her way to get my attention and then implied me with all sorts of anecdotes about her past before Atlanta. Like how Freddy Krueger from the Nightmare on Elm Street movies had been based on a guy she had known back in Chicago. And how the famous urban legend that ended with... There, hanging in the door, covered with blood was a stainless steel hook. That actually happened to her. 
These are warning signs for people who are looking for a nice, sane, rational girlfriend to... You never know what's going on inside somebody like that. The fact was, after a long period of calm, I was deep into unknown territory now, never knowing when things would turn. I will take you places where you have never been. I will show you things that you have never seen. Alma? And I will see the life run out of you. Things are starting to become spooky again, and starting to feel all too familiar. Alma? <laughs> And logically, of course, this being a flashback, I knew it had to end differently this time. But nevertheless, I have to admit, this is where I lost my nerve. I don't want to get married for a while. When? I don't know. Maybe not at all. You have to. I'm sorry. You don't know anything! It was true. I still had no real idea of what had happened. Oh. The second-hand account I'd gotten of the book had described a very different story. But the fact was, I kind of forgot about Ghost Story for a while around that time. I don't believe you. Honestly, it disappeared from my life, and I didn't think about it again for a long time, though it would periodically crop up in dreams, usually ones bearing no similarity to the real events. Mm -hmm. Such as I told you. No pulse at all. And then, years later, when it was the furthest thing from my mind, one night it unexpectedly sort of sneaked up on me. I think I'll take a bite out of you. I was 28, living in a new place when she found me again. I'd been sitting out to eat one night and flipping channels on cable when I came across the opening titles. It was only just starting, and I figured, this time, I'll finally sit down and see it through at last. It had been 17 years since this story had begun. This is the worst story we know. The worst thing that ever happened to us. Most dreadful thing. Eva Galley. I've said it. Yeah. So this was it. At long last, I would finally know the story from the beginning. Know what lay behind this nearly lifelong source of primal fear that I'd unwittingly invited into my life. Say you'll stay with us forever. Know how a poor choice made in one's youth, albeit one mostly not made by me, could have repercussions throughout the years that would follow. After all, I'd never really wanted to be there in the first place. I'd just been sort of dragged into a situation that was clearly the province of older people. You get your dance. You all will. Can we just leave me out of this? I'm technically just a piece of baggage the old folks dragged along. Shall I tell you the truth? And no! <laughs> but this time I did make it, all the way to the end. I looked the horror in the face, and I didn't blink. We've got to hide the body. Hide it where we'll never be found. And then, it was over. Climactic. After nearly two decades, a sort of expectation built around this sort of thing that intimates this should be the most significant movie-watching experience of your entire life. But it wasn't. It was just okay. Not a great movie, not a bad movie, just a movie. And the ghost finally laid to rest. We put it behind us. Back to work, school, and then on with the rest of our lives. I could almost feel a sigh of relief that she had gone. But you know where this is going, don't you? The ghost story is never over when you think it's over. And when I started posting movie reviews to the Cornflow Flex website, ghost story seemed an obvious choice. But at that point, it had been five years since I'd seen it, and it seemed like maybe I should just dig it up again and refresh my memory on what was happening. Hey, 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 you! Stop, quick, 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 shoot, shoot, get away from there! Go! Good job. Crap!
I thought I'd put all this behind me. As if it had never happened. As if we had dreamed the whole affair. And yet I found, once again, I couldn't so casually rewatch it. And that's when I knew it would never really be over. Unless... I want to go to her house. But I hope you'll come with me. I will. So it looked like I was going back again to take as close a look as possible. I read the novel for myself this time and found a very different version of the story. Better in some ways, less effective than others. The character of crazy man Gregory Bateman's little brother occupied a total of three scenes in the movie. In the book, there were major characters whose backstory was related as the initial ghost story told by the character of Sears James, a bit of literary punning over the fact that the tale was a riff on The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And an amusing aside, most likely a coincidence, a more recent book by novelist Toby Litt, which also took Turn of the Screw as its inspiration, was titled Ghost Story. In an odd and almost certain coincidence, both Fred Astaire and Melvin Douglas are mentioned by name in the book, and they ended up playing major roles in the film. And in a rather unexpected twist, the book wasn't actually about ghosts. The crux of Straub's novel was to posit a single race of beings responsible for all the supernatural myths throughout history, from vampires and werewolves to cattle mutilating aliens. It's a great deal more rich and complex than the movie, but it does get kind of repetitive towards the end and features one glaring flaw. The shapeshifter premise presents us with an Eva Galli who is an evil predatory monster from the outset which has the unfortunate effect of feeling like a total whitewashing of the old men's guilt over believing that they had actually murdered and then concealed the murder of an innocent person. The film, by contrast, presents both sides as guilty yet sympathetic. The killing having been a tragic accident, we can feel pity for the old men for their lifelong guilt while still not condoning their actions, whereas Eva's targeting of her suitor's sons takes the righteousness out of her otherwise understandable desire for revenge, presenting a less black and white scenario gives the film a bit of an edge over its source material in this respect. Of course, many of you may be sitting there thinking, this isn't scary looking at all. And the fact is, if I had seen the film for the first time at my current age, I might well have agreed with you. If only we'd been 30 instead of 20. Instead, I find that it seems to be permanently filed under nightmarish in my head, reason to be damned. Years afterwards, I found any sort of image of a skeleton or anything like that to be terrifying. Until I saw this film, and got a whole new perspective on it. Sure, they may be ugly, but dead people are stupid. Get the hell out of here! So I pushed on, because for better or worse, it seems that curiosity is stronger than fear. But right around this time, I ran into a bit of a handicap. <laughs> Oh, uh, seeing my investigation could go no further, we were dealing with a decades-old story at this point after all, back before super deluxe DVD editions that gave all of the inside juicy details had become commonplace. But still, rumors abounded of alternate cuts shown in different places, and scenes people remembered seeing that weren't actually in the film. So where does one go for answers? I'll be back with help as soon as I can. Uh, actually, I was thinking of eBay where I finally tracked down this, a copy of the film's first draft shooting script. It was the most telling resource I'd unearthed yet. It gave me the closest look of the production I had ever gotten. And up close, it didn't look pretty. It was fascinating in the way that car wreck is fascinating. There was so much additional material that it never made the final cut. It could have easily added an extra hour of running time. The Bate brothers were far more integral to the story, and it actually dealt with the fate of the younger brother, who had never been seen again following this bit. Rhea and Nettie Dedham were much more integral to the story, whereas they'd ultimately just been whittled down to a few scenes in the 1930s flashback, and Ricky's parents had made an appearance, as opposed to merely appearing in the credits after what had been obviously a very last-minute decision. A very different ending had been scripted, one much more akin to the book, and a major scare scene had been jettisoned in favor of an inferior iteration. Originally, Dr. Jaffrey's death was going to be at the hands of this ghoulish apparition, which, in an ambitious effect sequence, was going to have swallowed the camera's point of view. Not only would this have given more context to Eva's parting words, I think I'd take a butt out of you. But it would have shaken things up at a point in the film where the scares were starting to become predictable and repetitive. The revised version was shot so late in production that actress Alex Griga actually had to be blue-screened into the scene, though I admit the fakery involved actually sort of works in favor of seeing her as a ghost. 
And all throughout, there was copious evidence of the director repeatedly second-guessing the proceedings, with a lot of hasty revisions and doctoring on display. The finale by The Pond, for example, just sort of screamed second unit given the performances. Seriously, what is it about being a cop in a tiny New England town that has hardened these guys to the point that they see a dissolving corpse fall out of a car and just sort of watch with indifference? They don't mean shit anymore. I mean, I've seen men stabbed. It means shit. Yeah, I've seen guns, guns too. They don't mean shit. It's also a bit weird that they leave Don at the galley house in the daytime, then night comes on, but when they're pulling the car up, it's daytime again. Night, day, doesn't mean shit. Of course, this whole exercise has been massive overkill on my part, based on the idea that something you're familiar with is less frightening. However, the fact remains that even something you're intimately familiar with can still scare the crap out of you. I thought you'd be dying to see me. Still, despite our long and often tumultuous history, no, I have to confess I kind of like the film now, even though it hasn't always been all that kind to me. I will take you places where you've never been. I will show you things that you have never seen. And I will see the life run out of you. Clearly, it's not a perfect film. The rather extreme trimming of the script left many parts unexplained. When Don says, Last time I saw Alma, she was wearing this. It's actually not true. We only ever see the pendant lying on the floor of her apartment. There's probably a last minute insert shot added after the pertinent scene was cut out. And I probably wouldn't be the first one to suggest that the gruesome corpses might have been best left out, as it seemed to work against the more classical style of the rest of the film. In fact, Alice Krieger herself offered much the same opinion. At the same time, there's much to admire here. If the film was being made today, it'd doubtlessly be attacked as a Tarantino ripoff for its non-linear recursive storytelling style, though it was making those same moves over a decade earlier. Alice Krieger, who may be tragically best remembered as the Borg Queen from Star Trek First Contact, is a truly unsettling and outstanding performance as Eva Galley, even making bad puns about dying to see her sound threatening. And while the film is largely forgotten these days, it does have a small legacy of which to boast. The cast assembled to play the Chowder Society leaves like a dream list of Golden Age film stars. The faceless, big-mouthed apparition finally saw screen time after all in the remake of House on Haunted Hill, and I'm convinced that the American remake of The Ring drew inspiration from it too, with the incongruous appearance of water whenever its ghost was around seemingly lifted straight from Ghost Story, though undoubtedly it lifted a few shots of its own from Psycho. The cast didn't fare quite so well. John Hausman continued to work until his death in 1988, but for Douglas Fairbanks Jr. it was his last film, and for both Fred Astaire and Nolan Douglas it was their last project period, with Douglas dying before the film was even released. The four young actors chosen to play the Chowder Society in their youth fared even worse, with only Ken Olin, who played the young Sears James, being the only one to survive past age 55, and the only one still alive today. Craig Watson was an up-and-coming star at the time, but his leading man prospects basically peaked in 84 with the Palma's body double and never really came back again. Though he did appear in the third Nightmare on Elm Street film, where he was spooked by a far cheesier skeleton. And Alice Krieger has worked consistently since, but never in the sort of high-profile roles that her talents have deserved. With all this information at my disposal, I ultimately authored the entire Internet Movie Database's Frequently Asked Questions section on the film, which led to me being sought out as a ghost story expert, and asked to contribute to what is undoubtedly the biggest tribute-slash-retrospective site on the film anywhere online. It's the sort of ending that that scared kid in that dark theater all those years ago never would have imagined in a million years. I said back at the beginning of this piece that this was a ghost story, and in a way that's true, because after all, what actually constitutes a ghost story? It's about something traumatic that happened in the past that should be over and done with and buried, but for some reason continues to hang around and vex and terrify people in the present day for what is usually no rational reason at all. But, for me, this is basically the end of the road. This story ends where it began for our characters. This is Eva Galley's house, or the house that stood in for it. It's outside Saratoga Springs, upstate New York. Fairly innocuous looking, just sitting here by the side of a large road. Belfry's not there anymore, but it's definitely the same house. It's even got that same tree over there on the left-hand side. Nowhere near as secluded or spooky looking as it appears in the film sometimes wonder if the people that live there have any idea where exactly it is they're living. But at this point, there's pretty much nothing else I can do. I've done everything that a protagonist in a ghost story is supposed to do. Gotten scared out of my wits. 
ran away, ignored it, and tried to forget about it for a while, gotten drawn back by curiosity, investigated it as clearly as I could, stared it in the face, and finally now exposed the story to the world. That's the end, right? At this point, the credits are supposed to roll, if indeed the protagonist of a ghost story is actually the Corbisette human and not the ghost itself, or if indeed there's any meaningful difference between the two. Who are you? I am you. But let's not dwell on the negatives. Hopefully, with the creation of this video, after a lifetime, I will finally actually be out of this particular ghost story.